of Israel to its full national life, to bring our collective soul, our collective neshama to expression, to the Jewish kingdom, sovereignty, Bede Mikdash, economy, industry, agriculture, all that is holy, to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What is the content of that collective soul? The divine ideal for all of creation. We call here, we'll see the name of God, the name of God, that which good he, he wishes to bestow upon the world for which he created the world. That neshama comes out when the Jews in the land of Israel, that enables that personality, that inner soul to be revealed. So we saw at the beginning in Hezekiel 36, verse 26, uh, 16, we started how the Jews are in Israel, the land of Israel, defiling the land, they're exiled from the land because of their sins. And then you'll come amongst the nations into which you have come, and you'll defile, desecrate my holy name. So we pointed out, we saw, what is the desecration of God's name? 36, Yechezkel 36. You, you, man, you have it. 36 verse, and now on 20. You desecrate my holy name. We saw just by the fact of the Jewish, the presence of the Jews outside the land of Israel constitutes this desecration of God's name. The exile, in and of itself. Why? So we said one explanation simply because the God's name is connected to the Jewish people. If they're suffering, if they're weak, if they're exiled, if they're downtrodden, if they're, they can't even be in their land of Israel, the promised people are supposed to be in the promised land. It shows a reflection on God's name, on God's weakness, God forbid. Where is your God now? But also, we said even deeper, there's an understanding, an objective, an ability of God's name to be revealed. The name of God is that, when it says, oh, you desecrate my name, my name is not able to come to its full expression. My name is that, like I said, the divine ideal for all of creation. That absolute good, that absolute uh, divine plan for creation, that blessing for all. That cannot come to expression except through the nation of Israel and the land of Israel. That is the vehicle that God created. Therefore, the, the very fracturing of that vehicle, there's no body to receive that neshama, to express that neshama. It says in Yeshayahu, Notein neshama la'amale, I give the neshama to the people upon the land. So the Svatemet talks about that there, that in the land of Israel, that enables that neshama, that God's ideal, that inner divine shechina, divine presence to be, <coughs> to be revealed. God's presence <coughs> exists. <coughs> the neshama, like individually, when God forbid the person is, the body is fractured into pieces, the neshama is eternal, is in the upper realms. But to be revealed in this world, it requires a body, a receptacle. That's the whole thing of the body of this world that enables the expression of that neshama, the inner personality, content, and good to come to be revealed in this world. And that's the goal of creation. And that's our function, to manifest that holiness, that godliness in this world, in life. But when the Jews are outside of Israel, that body is broken into pieces. Like it says in like in Migilat Esther, I'm a fuzar, I'm a furat, a scattered, broken people. Limbs in the hospital, we mentioned, like <laughs> lungs and the kidney machine, the like. But there's no, the personality, the life, the, the shama cannot be revealed. And that's why he says, you'll come out to the nations to which you come and desecrate my holy name. There's a big name. The holy name is that absolute expression of God, right? The name is how you're expressed, how you're seen, how you're called. The name of God, not God is desecrated, but his name is desecrated. His name cannot come to its full expression because his name is revealed through the Jewish people independent in the land of Israel. So that we saw. So then, therefore, God says, what's the conclusion, so to speak, that he tells the prophet, and I will have mercy on my holy name that you have desecrated amongst the nations that you came, verse 21. So what I'm about to do is now because of my name. My name is at stake. My goal cannot be withheld for, forever. The goal of creation will be, you have free will, but there's a limit to that. There's a time that God will say, now I'm going to bring the ideal, I'm going to bring the betterment of the world. In, with you or in spite of you. That's what it says here in verse 21, 22. Therefore, said the house of Israel, what I'm about to do to you is not for your sake. Not because you're worthy or deserving and now you've fixed your ways and now you deserve to come back. But now, as we mentioned, the Ramchal calls it the Hanagata Yuhu. There's another dimension of God guidance, not just to free with the, according to your free will, reward and punishment. There's what he calls Hanagata Yuhu, the, the supreme uh, transcending ideal that must be, that will be that is not dependent on anything in this world. So usually he runs the world by what you deserve. You give and what you get, you what you deserve. But there's a time, and what it says here, the super goal is now pushing, and now pushing out, and has to be and will be. For my name's sake, 
What I'm allowed to do is not for your sake, not because you're deserving. We went to exile because of our sins, but we're coming back to Israel, he says now, in spite of our sins. What I'm allowed to do is not because you're worthy, not for your sakes, because of, rather because of my holy name that you have, again, over and over again, desecrated amongst the nations unto which you have come by being there. And then what is the... What is the sanctification of God's name? I said, now I'll sanctify my name, my big name, right? There's my big name, my holy name. The big name being, again, that goal of all of creation. Every mitzvah you do, also in New York and Europe, it's, it's a sanctification of God's name, brings down God's light to the world. But here we're talking about the big name, the super name, the, the, that total name of God that comes down to the Jewish people, not as holy individuals, but, like I said before, the Ten Commandments, you're told you will be unto me a mamlechat koinim v'goy kadosh. Which is what? Kingdom of peace. Priests and a holy nation. Holy individuals, you don't have to be Jewish. There's very moral, righteous uh, individuals, non-Jews in the world. And there's very immoral and not righteous Jews in the world. But the, the goal of Am Yisrael, what it says in Yeshayel 43, 21, Am this nation have I created unto me to say my praise. There's a national entity, a priori, not because of your doing, not your understanding. I created this nation to say my name in the world. This is the vehicle that enables this this, this channel of godliness to come to the world. That's not our doing. We mentioned that, right, in the Maral and Netzach Yisrael, chapter 11, the difference between Avram Avinu and Noah. Avram Avinu wasn't chosen because he was holy and good. That's why the Maral explained there's no introduction to him, how holy he was, how righteous, and then God spoke to him. It's independent of that. He was holy and righteous. But God came down, and this will be the beginning of Am Yisrael. Through you will be the nation of Israel. The whole world will be blessed through you. That's the conduit that I created, not your doing. And that's what it says here, I'm about to bring you back, to sanctify my name, my big name, the, to make you the might, to reinstitute that collective unit that reveals that collective soul, what the rabbis call Knesset Yisrael, or the Shekhinah, the divine presence. That's what's at stake here. Our redemption is not to make it easier for us. We were suffering in the exile. There's luxurious exiles, Yechezkel 36. We're the luxurious exiles. Jews are very, even free, or physically and spiritually uh, successful. They can do the mitzvot. That's not what's at stake here. When the Jews are in exile, that is the breakdown, the inability to the full expression of the big name of God, the absolute name, the goal of creation is at stake here. My name, my big name, and therefore I'm going to bring you back to the land even though you're not worthy. So we saw in verse 23, I will sanctify my name and the nations will know what I'm about to do to you, that I will sanctify myself, through you, in their eyes. It was the first stage. We saw this talking about stages, right? We saw this is one of the prophecies explicit about the stages of redemption. That was the background we got to the source. We saw the Yushalmi, that the redemption the rabbis tell us will come in stages, stages. Kima, kima. Remember that? Kima, kima. Slowly, slowly. So here we see it explicit in the prophecy. There are stages in this coming back to be this kingdom of priests and holy nation. Here we're talking about people that aren't worthy yet. So they're not worthy. They're not so holy on the surface. So, so here, let's, that's where we're starting now to read. And therefore, what will I do in verse 24? I will take you up from the nations and then gather you from the lands and bring you to your land. What we call the ingathered exiles. That is the first stage of the sanctification of God's name. But the big question, how can they sanctify God's name? We're talking about what people? He's bringing back to the land people that aren't, aren't worthy. What I'm about to do is not because of you. I'm picking you up and bringing you back. Wait a minute. What? Let's call a spade a spade. Are we bringing back secular Jews? In other words, the secular state. What? Where is the sanctification of God's name in that? So we mentioned it's not over yet. The stages. It's not complete. But the beginning, the sanctification is in that. And now the baby is born. Now the body now that can receive that neshama. He's not yet living up to it. Not yet expressing it. Not yet holy expressively, in other words, consciously, is not living up to that holy neshama, but now the body is in the world that now has that neshama is starting to be revealed in the world. That is the first sanctification, the first stage of that sanctification. On that we are all so thankful and, and, and to God that now the re redemption is beginning, his name is coming to expression, and not yet complete, like I said, the baby doesn't yet learn Gemara, doesn't know how to uh, do a lot of things. It's only the physical existence and the how do you say the diapers and the, you know, or the economy and security it's worried about. But that the baby, we say Shechiano, the Brit, whatever, the baby's born. There's now a body. What's just for the body? You're thank, thankful? What it looks like everyone else? Uh, another body of other people. No, this is the body that received that neshama inside that body. 
it's not revealed yet. There's, there's stages. And bar mitzvah is more obligated to the mitzvot and stages and stages of more of the expression of that neshama. But when the baby's born, you're thankful on that it's a neshama now in the world. It's not different. In other words, it's not the same in the world before the baby's born or after it. Before you could say 1948 or before, after 48. There's a new energy level. Now there's a, an independent body that now is the vehicle that God created to receive and express His name in the world. Ah, but the baby's not aware of that yet. We have a lot to do yet. And that's what the next stage is. Let's go on. I think we left off. And then the next verse is another stage. I will pour upon you these waters of purification and I will purify you from all of your impurity and all of your idolatry. I will purify you. If it wasn't clear up till now, here you see explicitly that who are the people back in Israel? That people still require this in purification. They came back with their impurity. Yes. I mean, it's as is. I'm bringing you back. You have to be now. The baby will be born. The neshama, the redemption will be. The world will not remain in its present state forever. I waited a hundred, a thousand, two thousand years for you to, how do you say, initiate and bring the redemption. But nevertheless, there's a time I said, that's it. Like I said, this is now the kicks in the other way of God's guidance. If you look in the book, that Tvunot, the Ramchal, now it's for my name's sake. And now I'm bringing you back as you are. But then there's again, you don't say that's not the end of the redemption. That's it when everyone just the baby's born and acts improperly. No. Then I will purify. Then there's stages of purification. But you see here that I, it requires a purification from all of your tuma, all of your impurities, and all of your idol, your evil ways. And Rav Kook used to say how Rav Tzuda, how this is like a metaphoric for like a medical treatment. These whole stages of, of redemption, of purification, are like a medical treatment. First we have coming back to the land of Israel, breathing the healthy air. Like you go to these health spots in the world, to come back to, I can tell you stories, I don't have time, of uh, the healthy air of the Jewish people to breathe the air of Eretz Yisrael. And then there's Zerak Dilechev. What is Zerikot? Your Hebrew, modern Hebrew, what is a Zerika? No, but as we call it, medical-wise. Ah, shots, inoculation, shots. So now there's uh, shots, right? You get inoculations to purify, to help you, to remedy. And what's the next stage? No, I didn't read it yet, but you can read it here with me. Menatati lechem. What's that? What's that in a medical? Transplant. Heart transplant. Here's stages of purification. You came back. Not perfect, not ready, not worthy of this redemption. So the redemption won't come till you're ready? No. There's a time when it comes. We saw that in the beginning, right? The lo zahu, if you're worthy, it comes in one way. If you're not worthy, it doesn't come. No. Then it comes in another fashion. And that's what he's talking about here. So here it requires stages of purification. But first come back. Not like wait till you're purified in New York. If everyone does tshuva, then I'll bring you back. Here it says I'm bringing you back in spite of the fact that you're not. Because the time has come for the world to start to be redeemed and elevated and perfected. And then in the land, there will be stages of this medical. Again, it's not so clear what these things are enigmatic, these zrikot, the sprinkling of pure waters and a new heart. What does that mean, literally? Or actually, the, the rabbis say that the new heart, um, it says, I'll give you a new heart, not like the heart of, uh, get rid of the heart of stone. I'll give you a new heart of flesh. The rabbis say the Yetzirah is this heart of stone. That's one of the terminologies uh, the Gemara talks about. There's different five names of the evil inclination. One of them is this stone of, uh, the stony heart, the heart of stone. I'll give you a new heart. The rabbis say that's the abol abolition of the Yetzirah. It'd be a new era of man does good by himself, naturally. In other words, uh, normal, he'll be healthy. Not because he has to overcome different inclinations and drives to do evil, but he overcomes and manages to conquer that drive. But the man will be normal, just do we want to do good. I'll read you something about that. And then the next stage, a, um, I'll put into you a new spirit. Right? Verse 26, I believe. I can't see it, mine. 27. At Ruchiyate, I'll put my spirit inside of you. No, 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 no,
Ruhi atem kibbechem, I'll give you an, a spirit, my spirit, the spirit of God, and then you should do my statutes. Here we get to the mitzvot, the re- people are waiting for the religiosity. Here we get, now it comes down to the individuals doing the mitzvot. In other words, there's a new spirit. The rabbis say that's ultimately the, the barbanel, I think, no, Tikkun Ezor, also the barbanel. This is the spirit of prophecy. But nevertheless, it's not so clear, we'll see more as we go on maybe more explicitly these stages. But we see that there, first of all, we saw that the exile constitutes a desecration of God's name, an ability to fully express the God's name that is revealed to the Jewish people and dependent on the land of Israel. But blessing is waiting for the world to come by our presence here. If the world knew what it was, like the rabbi saying in the Midrash, if the, those that destroyed the temple knew what the temple was for them, what blessing comes to them by having the Jewish temple in the New Shalim, they would have put all their legions to protect it, certainly not to destroy it. So too, the redemption, if they knew what it was, if, when the rulers will see, is that they'll be very embarrassed in the future when they recognize what the blessing that they hurt themselves by holding up the Jewish presence in the land of Israel. It's not just they're against the Jews. They're, they're self-defeating. And then it'll be revealed what blessing, but it says to Avram Avinu, the nations will be blessed through you. This conduit of bringing down godliness, otherworldliness, something from beyond this world into this world comes through this vessel. The forces of evil sense that. That's why they're attacking this vessel. They want to hold up that good and prevent. And that's why what's going on today is attempts of evil. We see who the forces against Israel. The forces of evil that are trying to hold up that fullness of the Jewish sovereign land of Israel. And that's how we know the success because it's not our success or military only. It's the, the victory of God's name, the good over evil. And that's what's taking place today, this process of uh, the victory of, uh, the, first of all, the recognition of who the forces of good and evil, it's clearly who's on what side. And we know that God is on the side of the good, and that's what will be ultimately will be revealed. But how? We, we have to recognize who we are. We are that vehicle. Again, Godly created. It's not us, uh, our doing. We're better. We cre- the God created the world with different functions, like in the body, have different limbs. There's the heart, there's the legs, and the fingernails. They're all important to make the complete symphony orchestra, all the instruments. But there's differences, there's levels, there's the heart that brings that life to all the land. So too, like the Zohar and the Kuzari says, the Jewish people are this heart of the nations. But not for themselves, because they get a pat on the back, you're greater, you're better. You're, you're chosen to be that unique vehicle to bring blessing to all, to bring good to all, not for your selfish need, the opposite. Your whole existence, your whole essence is your non-selfishness, the good to bring good, God's good and name and life and holiness to all of existence, all of life. In this world, not some spiritual ideal, but a real reality of a nation that lives in the land. And for that we have to be in the land. For that we want the land, not for a more possession, more territorial uh, conquest. For the, every border, the borders of Israel, that vehicle that were the Jews in the land of Israel, the, the Chesed Avraham, the great grandfather, grandfather of the Chida, the, the Chesed Avraham written by Rav Avram Azulai. He's buried in Hebron. Um, I said, the grandfather of the Chida, of Chaim Yosef David Azulai, a famous giant of Torah. The, uh, no, it's just a few years. Uh, not a few years, I mean a few years, but Achronim, yeah, certainly. Um, the Chida, it's a long story how they brought his, he was buried outside of Israel and they brought his bones, Rabbi Eliyahu. He's buried over here in Haram Menuchot. But his grandfather, his great, I'm not sure, grandfather, great grandfather, of Avram Azulai, it's a famous book of Kabbalah, the inner workings of Torah and understanding. And he writes how um, the Shekhinah will not be complete. In other words, I get what we're talking about here. The God's name, the revelation of his name in this world, the blessing of creation will not be until all the Jews are in all the borders of Eretz Yisrael. That's how it's built. It's not a matter of, again, territorial conquest. That's... Uh, the heart has to be in its place. So you cut the heart in different pieces and scatter it around the body. It functions, that's how it functions. That's how it's built to be, that when the Jews are in these borders, tiny borders, not like we conquered the world, in these little borders, that is when the heart now enables this flow, this conduit of life, of energy, of holiness, from, not from this world, from beyond this world, of godliness, into this world, to raise all of creation, to make a better world. And that's where we're talking about the process, how that comes about after 2,000 years of separation, of being fractured, and not having that body. How do we come back to be that nation? So first it says, I'm bringing you back for my name's sake. The goal has to be, and now you're coming back. And then there's stages of now preparing you to be more and more worthy and live up to that, being that living receptacle of the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So I'll bring you back to the land. There'll be the sprinkling of waters. There's a commentary to the Mishnah. Right, you all have, and then you see the Mishnayot, there's the classic commentators 
on the right and the left, like Rashi and Tosar and the Gemara and the Mishnah, there's a lot of commentaries, but usually the classic Mishnah Yoda, there's the Rav Avadia Bartanura and the Tosar Yom Tov. The Tosar Yom Tov on the Mishnah, the end of Yuma, Yoma, it says, um, who, lucky are the Jewish people, who purifies you, Mikvah Yisrael, the, the Mikvah, have you said the Mikvah in English? Uh, I don't even ritual bath. The ritual bath will purify you, and God, God is the one that purifies you, and I will sprinkle you waters of purity upon you, and you shall be pure. Which is the verse from Yechezkel 36. And on that he explains that there's the two types of purity, of becoming pure. There's the mikvah, and there's this uh, sprinkling of water from above. The mikvah, man enters, you go into it by yourself. It's your initiative. The sprinkling, he says, is from above. He says like this. The, the proper way is that we're supposed to choose and make prepare ourselves and to sanctify ourselves to be worthy vehicles. And so who do you purify yourself in front of God? Sometimes the man is not so perfect and he doesn't overcome his um, negative inclinations. And God takes the initiative and sprinkles upon him the purification like we're reading here in Yechezkel. It's a divinely initiate, like he says here, for my name's sake. Even though, he says, without man's awakening, even though they're desecrating his name. They're not, in other words, they're not such good people. But this is what the prophecy is talking about. There'll be a divine initiative that he says, now I'm going to purify you. In spite of all that, I will take you and gather you and purify you. There's another way that we take the initiative, like a person that goes into the mikvah, like he takes the initiative and, as he did last Wednesday, goes into the initiative, takes initiative on his own, and Tovel immerses himself. But here, Yechezkel 36 is talking about this way of God, that God says, look, I waited, I waited, I waited for you to take the initiative to do to you what you're supposed to do. But there's a time when now I will purify you from above. But let's go on to the... Actually, no, there's something to say more, a lot more. One question about the, the, con the context of Yeheska. What, what period of... We believe this is referring to the final redemption. When was he living? Yeah. In the time of Yeheska. Uh, what do you mean? In the time of... Uh, uh, of the you don't have those charts? Of, uh, time line of the beginning of the Babylonian Galut. Huh? And he was in exile. He even talks about it. We'll see the next chapter. He's... Uh, uh, Daniel and, uh, I had those charts once, I'll bring you, but there's a book for the chart, but maybe I'll bring you the list of showing you when. But this is referring to, he says, there'll be a time, tell the Jewish people in the future there'll be a time where I will take them out of the exile, bring them back in spite of their unworthiness, for my name's sake, in order to bring about my name to this world. But again, the, what I want to say is that this Lona Manchem, those two words, or from our saying it, from our point of view, lo leman shemecha, for your name's sake. Like he says, I'm doing it for my name's sake, for my holy name's sake, for my big name's sake. What does that mean? Remember, there's a thing, there's a, an approach to understand that God does things for, that's what we're supposed to, our whole intention for the mitzvot should be for God's name's sake, not for our private benefit, individual benefit. What is, how do we do, how do we bring down God's name? Good, in other words, how do we make the world a better place? In idyllic content, leman shemecha, for your name's sake. I do the mitzvot for your name's sake. We saw the Rambam and Elul, I think we saw the Rambam in the end of the laws of Tshuva, chapter 10, that one should not serve God out of uh, the intention of getting the benefit, the blessings that God promises for those who do the commandments and to avoid the punishment that the Torah warns you if you do the sins. That's still a person who is doing it out of Yirata Onish, which means what? Fear of punishment. Because ultimately, as the path of the just, chapter 19 says, who are you serving? Who are you worried about? So. Yourself. He says, so self. He says, even more than that, he says. He brings down the verses that he says, he that wants to merit the world to come and to sit before God and have the pleasure of the spiritual pleasure of not some physical that wants to be rich or wants to avoid punishment. And the, he wants to, in the world to come, to recognize that God runs the world and to be in the front row and the... In the spiritual blessing, uh, how do you say, uh, greatness that you have in God's presence, he says we can't say that that person is uh, bad intention. But he says ultimately it's not the best, for ultimately he is serving himself. He's worried about himself. Spiritual, he believes in God, he's not just worried about, you know, I want to 
avoid punishment of suffering and sickness. I, I want to, the blessings of the world, that he believes in and beyond this world, beyond the... But ultimately, he's serving for his own private benefit. The Torah ideal is to serve for the ideal, for the sake of the absolute good, to bring God's name into this world, the good for all. That, we don't have orot, the real orot, the full orot. Uh, I think we read it to you a few times, but... Um, orot, orot? You have it in Hebrew? No, that's only, it doesn't have the whole translation. There's a, par- there's a section in orot at the end called Orot Yisrael. Uh, chapter 1 and paragraph 4. Maybe we should see it inside. Maybe next time we'll see it inside. Because it's so... Maybe I'll make up copies. So. Um, but that's the essence of our neshama, to put it quickly. The neshama of Am Yisrael, or Lord, will bring a few. I mean, if... So, so we'll wait for that. But what I to say is our intention and our motivation in doing mitzvot like, what are we doing this all for? Because we believe in God and He rewards and punishment. We believe there is a God. A God doesn't believe, does He? does whatever He wants. He's free, so to speak, to do what He wants. But here we're talking about a person who believes there is a God. There is a policeman watching. But it's very, again, his whole intention is worried about himself. I don't want to get caught by the policeman. Yeah, but it's a level already. He believes that there is this divine policeman that you can't see. And nevertheless, he believes in that. But his whole focus is very selfish, private, self-centered, egoistic. What's in it for me? I saw once, uh, I shouldn't say, but anyway, an advertisement for yeshiva, for something, learn what, what's in it for me, like Judaism. Okay, that's a good way to start. I mean, you have to start. That's what the Rambam says. A child has to start with that. You get reward, you get, uh, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. If he starts, the Rambam talks about that in one of the letters, uh, the introductions he has of you give a child, they give you a chocolate bar if you do your homework, if you do this. Then he gets more whatever, and then he, I'll give you a bicycle, and he gets more uh, advanced. I'll give you money. Wow. Money if you do this. But he's always doing something for the ulterior motive of, of the gift, not for the value of itself. He never appreciates the, of what he's doing for the sake of the ideal. And then he says, no, later the person grows up and realizes money isn't everything. What's everything? Honor, kavod. Right? In this world, to get honored, to be respected, to be called a, a rabbi, a scholar, etc. And then he gets to know that all in this world is all meaningless. Compared to, uh, he's doing it all for the sake of the world to come. But again, all those stages are stages that he's still focused on the me. But well, we all still have the, like, the childish oh, part of ourselves. The Ramam says this level of being totally idealistic is very, at a high level, it's hard to attain. But we have to know where we're going, what our goal is. The man Shemecha, I wanted to say what it says here, to do for your name's sake. First of all, I want to show you that that is the, the theme, let's call it, of all of Torah, all the Tanakh, and all of our prayers. You said this morning, right, Monday and Thursday, the long Tachanun. If you didn't pay attention, so next time pay attention, or do it, I'll give you the homework, of tell me how many times this theme of the man shemecha is mentioned. We say, God help us, save us, redeem us, forgive us. Why? Because we're so good. We didn't mean well. We, we didn't mean to do against you. No. The one thing that goes over and over again, save us, redeem us, help us. Why? Over and over again. It's not once, not twice, not three, not five, not ten. Le man shemecha, for your name's sake. Because our redemption, our being safe and happy in the land of Israel is not for our private benefit. Your name is at stake here. The world's good. All of creation, the whole purpose of creation is at stake here. So therefore, even though we're misbehaving children, and we agree, that's true, it's unfortunate, whatever, but you can't get rid of us. You can't, so to speak, keep us in the exile, ultimately. You have to redeem us. Why? Over and over again. Look at how many times. Laman Shemecha. For your name's sake. But I'm going to show you, hopefully, a few sources throughout. That's the whole Tanakh is based on that. All the leaders that came to defend the Jewish people. You mentioned it last week, no? I think about the sin of the spies. Wasn't it you? Someone mentioned it. Already preempted that. How uh, the leaders always defend the Jewish people. Like the lawyer. What's the line of defense? No, they were... Um, oh, Moshe and... Uh, right, the sin of the spies. The we mentioned it, but you'll see, I want to show you how it's not just Moshe, how that's the, the, throughout the Tanakh. This is the... I have a few sources photographed. But since, David... If you have now Orot, not only is that the goal, the ideal... 
But that is the essence of the Jewish people. That is our inner nature, our true nature. It's not just some far off moral goal that you should try to be idealistic. Do your best to get out of your private focus. That is the real you. So if you have in the back, there's what's called Orot Yisrael. It's on page Kuf Lamed Tet. Those who don't have it, I'll read to you. I'll try to translate as we go on, or maybe write directly to the English. The it's hard to translate. Atzmut Achayfet, the inner essence, or the desire, the essential desire for the good for all. In other words, there's this desire, this want, this need, aspiration to bring good to all. This inner essence, this essential desire to bring good to all. What does the all mean? Without any limitation whatsoever in the world. In other words, with no limitation whatsoever. Neither. No limitation to the quantity of those you wish to bestow the good upon. You want to give good to all, to everyone, to everything, man, creatures, animals. To bring good to all. And no limit whatsoever to the quality of the good you wish to bestow. Limitless good. In quantity and quality. That inner essence, or that essential desire, zeh garin hapnimi shel mahut nishmata shel knesset Yisrael. There's five levels here. That is, I'll first translate it. That is the inner kernel of the essence of the neshama of knesset Yisrael. Knesset Yisrael, we said, is this collective life source of the Jewish people. Before we come on the scene, individuals, we have there's a we mentioned this collective life force which I mentioned before, that's called Knesset Yisrael, the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, that inner Divine Essence, that is this Divine goal for creation, this absolute good, this infinite, that is the source of the Jewish people. That is our life force. We can, again, we have free will to live up to that, to express it. The Jews that can go against that, we can, we can be evil people, but that's against our nature. Our true inner, inner, inner nature is this kernel of godliness that is thrown into this world in the form of people that come out that we have Jews throughout history. But there's more than that. That's the Knesset Israel. That's the inner collective life force of the Jewish people throughout history. But then he says there's the neshama, the soul of that collective life force. The soul of the soul. And there's even more than that. There's the essence of the soul of that Knesset Israel. And there's even more than that. There's a kernel. And even more than that, more internal. There's an inner kernel of the essence of the neshama of Knesset Israel. In other words, the inner, inner, when you peel down what is Am Yisrael, what is the inner, true, immutable, divine aspect, that is the absolute desire for good for all. That's the definition, if you wish, or the attribute of the Jewish people. Again, not just the Jewish people on practice. The inner, inner essence of who they are. And that's like an a priori. That's not our decision. That's not our making. That's not our doing. That's not our... Uh, our obligation and our privilege is to reveal that, to express that in all of our life. The Torah and the mitzvot and the good traits, those are the things that vehicles that enable that neshama, that goodness to be expressed and revealed, which is our goal, to express it in this world. Not to leave it as some sublime, transcending inner essence. But that is, first of all, you should know who you are. Know thyself. Your inner, inner self is the absolute desire for good for all, with no limit whatsoever. As we say in Ashray, he brings it down later. The Pasuk in Ashrei, right? Tilim 145. Tov Hashem Lako, that God is good for all. That is the divine essence of the Jewish people, that we are similar to God, that we're with that divine image of God, that absolute desire for good for all. I'll read you something else I hope I brought. Oh. I have one more copy. Actually, it's in that book of Rav Kook in the English. I don't know if I can find it here. That book of Western classics of spirituality, a few quotes of Rav Kook. But I'll read it to you quickly. We're talking about we have to get out of this privateness, this selfishness. A person must liberate himself from the confinement within his private concerns. Let's take me a pratiyud. Get out of this selfishness. Like we said here, that's your true self. That's your, not becoming something else. Trying to love, to rise up to some altruism and become so right idealistic that's your true essence but most of us like you said are not there especially at the beginning we have the sense that the child it's all himself and it's private the senses pick up the you you and more and more we have to get more of the spiritually the unity which is on the spiritual level and get up to the source of all connecting to hashem you more are connected to all 
if you're locked in the physical world, you see the separation. It's me, I don't feel your pain, you're separate from me, different bodies. But if you get to the level where we're connected, the roots of the soul of Am Yisrael and the soul of all of creation, remember, there's, we, there's that fourfold song of Rav Kook. I mentioned, I think, maybe also last time, that there's this also the Lord of Kodesh. Rav Kook has a song called, um, called the fourfold song, the Shir Ruba. It's he that sings the song of his private self. He's worried about, concerned about, focus on my private benefit, welfare, spiritual and physical. Then there's one who rises up more to sing the nation or sings the song of his family or the nation. And then there's one that rises up and he sings the song. He's worried about his focus is on, he, he's not just say, talking about, he lives at his life level of concern for the good of all of mankind. And then there's one who concerned for the good of all of existence. And the song of God, that is the shalom, the, the God of the, sings all the songs. He's the, the God of all, the, the source of oneness of God is that you're connected to all. It's all one world and you're, you're all part of, you're part of something much bigger. The you is elevated. You are concerned with yourself, so to speak. But your advanced understanding of who is yourself. Yourself is me, the flesh that I end here and you start something. But me is my soul, the spiritual, the connection to the soul of Israel, the soul of creation, of connected to Hashem. We're all parts of this expression of godliness in the world. The, the love of all, the consideration for all, the care for all, the desire to benefit all. That's the Neshama of Am Yisrael. That's our nature. That's, he says you must liberate yourself from confinement within the private concerns. It's when it pervades your whole being so that all his thoughts focus only on his own destiny. That reduces him to the worst kind of smallness and brings upon him endless physical and spiritual distress. A lot to explain here. But it is necessary to raise a person's thought and will and his basic preoccupations, his will. He becomes a person that he's preoccupied. His, his focus, his life level is toward universality, to the inclusion of all, to the whole world, to man, to the Jewish people, to all of existence. This will result, look what he says here, in establishing even his private self on a proper basis. It's not like you have to sacrifice yourself your individuality, your private concerns for the benefit of the, on the altar of the whole, of the universal uh, godliness in the world. That is your true essence. In other words, you're part of this bigger, it's like the part of the body that, um, that's what I mentioned about Hakasat Adam, taking out the bloodletting. I said in the Kuzari, 319. I didn't mention it here. He also says, you're a, you're a limb in the body. If the body is sick, so that's not my concern. I'm worried about myself. But if the body goes, he says, the, the, you go with it. In other words, the benefit of consideration for others is not other. It's like I said, it's giant you. Imagine the famous story of Rabbi Levine. He goes to the doctor and he says, what's bothering you? And he says the name of his wife. My, the leg, my, my wife's leg hurts us. It doesn't just hurt her. It's not some far off thing that's separate. We're one body, one unit. The world, and the higher you get to this level of perception, and we'll see how that wasn't so available in the exile. Being the fractured nation, you, you're broken down to the individual. That's all there was. You can't even think of something greater because it didn't exist. It was something, how do you say, um, otherworldly. We'll see how the redemption of coming back to Israel enables us more to come back to this understanding of the world as one, as living as one entity. And the concern for others is concern for yourself. It's concern for the bigger true you, the real you. He says, putting, putting yourself on this understanding, this life level, establishes even his private self on a proper basis. And he brings about, this brings about such joy and happiness and goodness. It's a different world. You, you live in goodness and a healthy, because you're normal. Being on this level is not something, again, it's sacrificing yourself and it's difficult and challenging and oh, it's nice and ideal, it sounds good. This is what you're made for. This is your true essence. And, made, and, and therefore, to be this way is to be the most healthy to be the most normal, to be yourself. You're living what you were created to be. Not to do so is going against yourself. You'll be an angst and vent, like he says here, pettiness and, and endless physical and spiritual distress. People don't know why they're distressed, why they're depressed, why they, because they're not living themselves. To be not to be this holiness, this oneness, this connected to all and concern for all is is not normal. Is you have this angst, is you're not living your true self. A lot more to talk about. What I wanted to show is a few sources. Maybe I'll just start now. I don't know if we'll continue how much. But throughout the Tanakh, this is the theme. This Leman Shemecha, for God's name's sake. So if, um, no, we don't have all the sources. Maybe if you look in what we say every day in the morning, if you have the Tanakh, um, chapter 15 in Shemot. Right? The song on the sea. Right? We say that every morning. 
as Yashir. So there's a verse, verse number 7, 50, again, Shemot, Exodus 15, 7. Through the greatness of your excellency, you will come or overthrow those that rise up against you. The question is, who rises up against God? How can you rise up against God? Who are the enemies of God? What, people throw bows and arrows into the heaven and try to kill God? You have it? Everyone has it? 15, 7. So what does it mean? We say every day, right? Who are those, the enemies of God? Who are the, those that rise up against God? How do you shoot, uh, like how do you get God? So Rashi brings down from the source, from the rabbis. You don't have Rashi in front of you. Who are those that rise up against you? They are those who rise up against Israel. Similarly, it says in Tilim 83, for, la, for lo, your enemies are in uproar. And what is this uproar? Against thy people, they take crafty counsel, right? In Tilim 83. And on this account, because they're the enemies of Israel's enemies, it calls them the enemies of the omnipotent, of the omnipresent. The, Michilta, the, the Midrash uh, Halacha, the Mechilta, brings down the source. This is the source from the Mechilta. That the enemies of Israel are the enemies of God. Those who come against Israel are coming against God. Because of what I said before, that at both levels, that the Jewish people, that God's name is connected to the Jewish people, Hitting the Jewish people, beating the Jewish people, attacking the Jewish people, uh, missiles on and steroid, whatever, are not just missiles against steroid. That we have to empathize with them, feel that their, their pain is our pain. But the, the, their pain or the pain of Israel is the pain of God. The attacking the, the Jewish people is attacking on God. But one may say because the, Jewish name, the God's name is attached to the Jewish people, but also revealed through them. Literally, it's an attack on God. It's His name cannot be revealed when the Jewish people are suffering. But let's go on. Um, in Numbers, chapter 10, in Bamidbar, chapter 10, verse 35, which we also said this morning, Vahib bin Saron, read, read it in English, maybe? In dark, uh, what verse? Uh, 10, 36, 35. In dark with journey, Moshe said, Arise Hashem and let your force be scattered, that those who hate you flee from before you. And when it rested, would say, reside tranquilly. So what does this mean? What does it say? Mesanecha, lo? What is it? Oivecha, right? Rise up and let your enemies, your, your enemies be scattered. Who are your enemies? Who are the enemies of God? Mesanecha, right? Those that hate you. Who hates you? So the rabbis say, you look in Rashi there later, you'll see. I'm reading you in the translation. These are those who hate Israel. The enemies of God, those who hate God, are the ones who hate Israel. Because whoever hates Israel hates him who speak spake and the world became its existence. In other words, the, those who hate Israel are against God, are hating God. Because Israel is, again, that earthly representative, you want to call it, the manifestation, we'll see even a deeper level, the expression of God, godliness in this world. Hating Israel is hating God. And that is His name. We mentioned, what's the Chilul Hashem? But now we'll get to, just quickly, we'll start that, what you mentioned last week, the chapter 14 in Bamidbar, the sin of the spies. This is, like I said, maybe the We'll see a repeating theme. The defense. How does Moshe defend the Jewish people? God says, I'm going to destroy them. I'm making you into a new nation. After the spies said, what your friend said on the train there, we don't need to go to Israel. We can stay in the desert. We can be religious here. We don't have to go to the land. Uh, it's dangerous there. It's physically, spiritually, whatever, different reasons, excuses. The sin of the spies, they were the rabbis, the leaders. Ten out of twelve said, no, let's not go. Should I start over? No. no <laughs> okay. I'm scared. You. <laughs> so it says in chapter 14, the whole recap, I'm not going to go through the sin of the spies. Um, God says they sinned. They don't want to go to Israel. Okay, let them stay. I'll, I'll kill them and make you a new nation. The Jewish people will be, but through you. Uh, and verse uh, Moshe starts to say in, in verse 13, um, the Egyptians knew that you took us out of the land, right? Everyone knows that you're connected to Jewish people. You do us miracles. You do for us all these different things. And they will say, in verse 16, just to make things quick, we don't have that much time, remember those three words. The nations will say, you are unable to bring us to the land, and therefore you kill us in the desert. Rashi says, what's the logic there? What do you mean? 
they have seen that you are you brought them in from your great strength from their midst, and, and when they hear that you are killing them, they will not say that is because they have sinned against you, but they will say again that against them you are unable to fight, but against the against against them, meaning the Egyptians, right? The Egyptians will say. But they will say that against them, you are able to fight. Against the Egyptians, against Paro. But against the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, you are unable to fight. Why? He says later, why? Because there was, you were, that was one king of Paro. But in Israel, there's 31 kings. So you weren't able to fight. You were too weak to be able to bring them into the land. So you killed them in the desert. And therefore... Here, un, he was unable to bring them into the land of Canaan because the inhabitants of the land are strong and mighty. And the base, and the besides, one king, Paro, is not like 31 kings. And this is what they will say concerning the inhabitants of the land. And be, be, they will say, and Moshe says, because he had no power. The nations will say he had no power to bring him into the land. Be built the Holy And the line of defense here is not because the Jews are worthy or don't deserve it, but they will say it will attribute it to your weakness, right? Your name is at stake, in other words. But we'll see these, these three words that are repeated and throughout the commentaries, that throughout history, we'll see Yoshua and Shmuel, all throughout, the, they don't use those words. They say, for your name's sake. But the commentaries always bring down these words of Moshe, that the nations will say that you are weak. They will say that the, the, the downfall of the Jewish people, the suffering of the Jewish people, is your name, again, because you're connected to them, or also more explicitly because they're revealed through them. What happens to them is a reflection on you. And therefore, the line of defense throughout the Tanakh is Leman Shemecha, do this and save us and redeem us for your name's sake. Maybe just, um, and what is moment does, does God accept that? So in verse 20, it says, I forgave them like your words. Salachti Kidvarecha, we say that in the Slichot, right? Salachti Kidvarecha, what is like your words? I forgive them according to your word. Because of what you have said, what have you said that the line of defense that I accept? Lest the nation say, because the Lord was unable. But I will, again, there's reward and punishment. So I'll punish them. They'll all die. They will not, those that didn't want to come to land will not come to land. Every year they'll die, right? They'll all die. The age of six, they reach a certain age. They all, they, this, this generation will not enter the land of Israel. Those that didn't want to come, <laughs> you want, you'll stay there. But I won't kill them all at once. That'll look like I was too weak and I couldn't bring it in. It'll look like a natural thing. People die and a new generation will rise up and come. The ones who didn't participate in the sin of the spies. But maybe just one. No, I'll leave it for next time. I'll do it quickly. Get to Mincha. We'll have to, but look, pay attention clearly when you, in the prayers, not only in the Tachanun, but also in the Shemona Asrei. When do we say, Leman Shemecha? Or do we say? Or how many times we say? So I said, in the Tachanun, you'll see it clearly. The Monday and Thursday Tachanun, it's not one, not ten, not whatever. Count how many times. And also in the Shemona Asrei. It's uh, a theme. Because this is, all of Torah is based on that, is the it's, we're in it for this world, not for our sake, to bring down the absolute good for all. In other words, I've, Torah is very idealistic. It's a very strong demand upon us to be holy, to be righteous, to bring God's name, to bring, what does that mean? To bring good to the world. So, Zat Hashem. Let's come out of this war also. We'll see the good of Am Yisrael and the blessing.